Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Carl Ash. I'm a science communicator here at Brookhaven National Laboratory, and I have the honor to be your host today for the talk and live question and answering session we have about our COVID research at the lab. As a national lab, we bring unique expertise and capabilities, as well as many collaborators to this from all around the country to this fight. And in the next hour, we will share with you how we're doing this. And more importantly, we want to answer your question about our ongoing research. We will begin today with a 30 minute long presentation by John Hill. This presentation has been pre-recorded, but will be followed by, as I said, the live Q&A session with three of our scientists. You can already see them here with me. So feel free to start submitting your questions at any time during any of the chats, depending on which platform you're on. But before we start, I really would like to introduce our panelists first. Um, and I do want to start with our first panelist, John Hill. John represents the Brookha Brookhaven Lab in the Department of Energy's National Virtual Biotechnology Laboratory, which includes all 17 national labs working together to address the challenges in responding to COVID-19. He's also Deputy Associated Lab Director for Energy and Photon Science at Brookhaven Lab and the Director of the National Synchrotron Light Source too. NSLS2, how we call that facility in short, is one of our research facilities at Brookhaven Lab that has been instrumental for the COVID-19 research. Welcome, John. Thank you, Cara. It's a great pleasure to be here. Really looking forward to tonight and getting a chance to tell everyone about what we've been doing to fight COVID-19 and hopefully answer some of your questions. So looking forward to it. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you for being here, John. Our next panelist is Kirsten Kleiser van Dam. Kirsten leads the scientific computing research at Brookhaven Lab. She has served at Brookhaven's principal investigator for a large collaboration comprising of nine uh, of the national laboratories and more than 140 scientists, all focused on the fundamental COVID-19 research into vaccines and antibodies. Kirsten, thank you for being here. Hi, hi, Cara, <laughs> and good evening, everyone. It's, it's great to be here, and I'm looking forward to answering all your questions that you might have. And also joining us is Sean Mike Sweeney. Sean is the director of the Laboratory for Biomolecular Le Research, or LBMS, as we call it here. Um, he's also one of the leading scientists at NSLS2 in the area of structural biology. Um, LBMS is the home of state-of-the-art cryo-electron microscopes and other research equipment that has been used to study the building blocks of life and of COVID-19. So, or, and, and he, he and his group has also been involved strongly in the COVID-19 research also at NSLS2. Sean, thank you for being Hi, here. Hi, Cara. Thanks. I'm looking forward to this. It's going to be fun. All right. And again, you can submit all your questions about our research and what you're here in the talk now in the live chats on any platform you're on. And we will answer the question afterwards. So see you in half an hour again, and please enjoy the talk. First thing I wanted to say is that this is truly a collective effort. Uh, it spans a wide range of uh, people across Brookhaven, wide range of departments, and indeed outside the lab. COVID-19 is the challenge of our time. It is our World War II, if you like. In fact, sadly, more people will die from COVID, uh, more Americans will die from COVID than died in World War II. American soldiers died in World War II. So it's a really um, very serious challenge. And Brookhaven, I'm proud to say, has responded to that challenge. Uh, in many ways. I've highlighted some of the connections here. The National Virtual Biotech Lab that uh, Dune mentioned was stood up by the Office of Science right at the start of the pandemic, I think in early March. It coordinates all the COVID activities across the DOE complex. All the national labs are involved, all 17 of us. Um, we focused in that group early on on four areas, therapeutics, that is drug design, testing, so designing and manufacturing enough quantity tests to test people for COVID, the manufacturing issues associated with that and also with PPE and modeling the transport of the virus, uh, both in, in sort of within rooms and also in, from person to person. And I've listed some of the Brookhaven PIs who've been leading that effort here at, uh, at Brookhaven uh, associated with the NVBL. In addition, right at the start of the pandemic, we stood up at Brookhaven, a science and technology working group focused on the COVID issues, not just the research side, but for other ways the lab could help. That group got very engaged early and remains engaged. It's been really a pleasure working with them all. Another effort I wanted to highlight here is the LDRDs that we spun up. 
So we recognized very early on that research was where Brookhaven's strengths really lie. And we wanted to start some research programs in these areas very quickly to see if we could have impact. And Kathy, Kathy Barkegia, Jack Anderson, and the site office, the Brookhaven site office, all worked very closely together to get those up and running in a really remarkable period of time. And Ola Gang, Chun Lu, and Kumran Designan were all beneficiaries of that process. And I listed some of the departments here who've been involved. Uh, as I mentioned, it's been a very close collaboration. Biology, Light Source 2, Computational Science Initiative have grown ever closer as a result of these efforts. And as I mentioned, the Environmental Science and Climate Science Department, Instrumentation, Physics, all have been involved, all uh, uh, just jumping on board. It's been a real uh, pleasure to be involved with everyone who's been uh, so active in this, in this area, as you might have guessed. So I wanted to start just by outlining the talk. I'm going to go through first by just introducing the virus to you all and just to tell you a little bit about something in really layman's terms about how the virus works. And that will lead into then the second topic, which is in terms of drug discovery. How do you stop the virus working? How do you stop people getting infected? Um, and that's both an experimental story and a computational story. And I'll talk about both of those parts there. The third topic I want to discuss is computational modeling, and this is modeling the spread of the virus, uh, both um, from person to person, so something called epidemiology, uh, to model their spread in various situations. I'll give you some examples of the work the lab has been doing there. And then also modeling the flow of the virus particles out of, out of a person's mouth, for example. In, um, I'm going to show you some examples of how masks work, for example. But also this work applies to working building, working modeling HVAC systems, school buses with windows open, that kind of thing, to really uh, work out how we can um, deal with this virus. And the final topic uh, will be just be a quick uh, discussion of sensors. How can we sense the presence of virus in new, uh, more effective ways? So that's the plan. Uh, let me start with an introduction to uh, SARS-CoV-2. So this is a picture that I took from the New York Times of the virus. You can think of it as a ball. Uh, it's a ball made up of proteins. The green here is the membrane of that ball. Um, uh, and then the red pieces coming out of that are what we call the spike virus, the spike proteins. I'll talk a lot about the spikes. And then inside that ball is a bunch of other proteins, RNA and other things that uh, are the machinery of the virus. To give you a sense of scale, these uh, virus particles are really tiny. They're about 100 nanometers across. And to put that in context, uh, I'm showing you some figures here. So the virus is all the way on the left of the slide here. The thing next to it is just a regular uh, bacteria. Uh, that's maybe half a micron or so, so 500 nanometers, uh, five times the size of a coronavirus. And then you see the red blood cell here, which is about seven microns across. And these big black things are various pore sizes in water filters to give you a sense of scale. Another uh, measuring stick you might want to use is a human hair. That's about 100 microns across. Um, so that's um, a thousand times bigger than the coronavirus. So really very, very tiny particles. Let me show you a model of one. This is a more or less atomically correct version of the uh, SARS-CoV particle. This is about a million times, almost exactly a million times larger than the actual virus particle. And you see here the red spike proteins on the outside of the ball. Um, the white and blue here are what we call membrane proteins. I'll talk about a bit more about those later on. They are um, vital to some parts of the story. And then inside the virus are molecules, a bunch of proteins that, as you see in a second, take over the machinery in your own cell to make more copies of the virus. So the first step in the infection process is this virus uh, gets inhaled into your, um, into your nose, into your throat, and then down and starts infecting your cells. And so this is a, a model, if you like, of one of the um, surfaces of your lung cell. And the green here is what we call a receptor. Um, this is the ACID receptor. And the uh, protein, the uh, virus proteins bind to that, the spike proteins bind to that and form this uh, um, bound complex, if you like, the virus then opens up and deposits its contents inside the cell. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second. And just the other thing while I'm at the model, uh, what your body does to fight infections, it develops antibodies. So this is an example of an antibody, this yellow molecule here, another protein, which binds with the spike. And you can imagine if this uh, virus uh, particle is covered in these yellow proteins, if covered in antibodies, it could then not bind with your um, cells and you can never get infected. And that's how one of the mechanisms by which the body fights uh, infection. So to show that process sort of graphically, here's a cartoon diagram, if you like, of the uh, infection process. So if you start on the top uh, left-hand corner of the figure, you see this virus particle binding with that receptor. It then works its way into the cell 
where it opens up and deposits its contents, its genome inside your cell. And that literally takes over the machinery of your cell to make new copies of the virus, uh, which get made inside your cell and then ejected out to go off and infect the next cell. And that's how you get infected and that's how the disease spreads. So what we're interested in doing in terms of some drug discovery is how do we stop that process happening? What we want to do is get in the way of these various proteins binding and these various protein machines doing their, doing their job. And so in order to do that, we need to understand the precise shape of those proteins, exactly how they're arranged, the atomic arrangement of those proteins. So you can think of this one analogy as two jigsaw puzzle pieces. So you can imagine um, so sort of jigsaw puzzle pieces that might look like this, the protein and your um, the proteins on your own cell might join together like uh, a connection like that. If you could find a drug that would fit in that same hole and prevent that binding process in the first place, well, then you can stop infection. And that, in really simple terms, is one of the ways to try and, um, try and develop antiviral drugs. So there are two problems with this uh, developing such drugs. First of all, we need to know the structure of these proteins in huge detail, down to the atomic uh, precision, know where each individual atom is. And as I already showed you, these are tiny, tiny, uh, uh, microscopic things, nanoscopic things. So that's a very difficult uh, problem. And the answer to that problem is NSS2 or synchrotrons generally. And I'll show you exactly how that works in a minute. And then if you know the structure of the protein, then you have to figure out uh, what drug would work. And this is a huge combinatorial problem. Uh, the number of proteins in this virus uh, is, is large, tens of twenties, maybe 30 proteins, each of which has many different possible places on them to we call them pockets, where you could might imagine a drug binding. And then the number of drug combinations, uh, the number of potential small molecule drugs to use is also very large. So you've got lots of proteins, lots of pockets on those proteins, and lots of drugs. That adds up to billions and billions of combinations, literally. And so it's impossible to go through those all systematically and search for which ones uh, might work, and especially given how limited time we have right now. So there are two answers to this question. The first answer is, well, this is not the first SARS virus, we've, not the first coronavirus we've seen nor is it the first SARS virus we've seen. So we have a lot of intuition in the scientific community about what we could use to try and stop this uh, going ahead. So biologists can use their experience and their expertise to guess uh, or to predict which molecules might be good, uh, good, um, good binders in here, good, good inhibitors. And the second answer is we might be able to use computers to do that search for us in a much faster time frame than we could ever imagine doing ourselves. And we're doing both these approaches here at Brookhaven. I'll talk about both of them in the next few minutes. First, I want to explain how do you determine this atomic structure with such precision uh, in the first place? And the answer to that is you need to get a crystal of the proteins first. A crystal is nothing more than a regular arrangement of, uh, of something. So a gold crystal is a regular arrangement of gold atoms lined up in, in rows. A protein crystal is the same thing, but now these rows are made up of rows and rows of identical copies of the same protein. And that's really important because then with that protein uh, crystal in hand, and by the way, these protein crystals are very difficult to grow, you can then do a synchrotron experiment on that crystal. You shine an X-ray beam at the crystal, it scatters off that sample, diffracts, and produces a pattern uh, on the film or the camera that you're using to study with. Here's an example of an X-ray diffraction pattern from a protein crystal. The black dots here are where the X-rays are hitting the film, for hitting the camera. That's where the most intense X-rays are. And you see it forms this very beautiful pattern of, uh, of dots in kind of really interesting, uh, arrangements of these dots. Uh, it turns out the intensity of the dot and where it sits on the camera uh, tells you about the atomic structure. There's a direct mathematical connection between that diffraction pattern and the atomic structure. And so you can invert that diffraction pattern if you have enough data uh, and get the atomically precise uh, pictures of the, of the protein structure. This is a really important technique, protein crystallography. It's been amount, around for many, many years now. Uh, and synchrotrons have played a huge role in advancing this technique. And drug companies have been involved in this for many years now, recognizing the power uh, for use of this uh, in terms of drug discovery. And in fact, the statistic uh, I like to quote here is 96% of all drugs that the FDA have approved for all diseases in the last 15 years went through a synchrotron first. And so that really illustrates the power of this technique and the importance it has to drug discovery. What makes analysis too special is two things uh, in this fight. First of all, as I mentioned, these protein crystals can be very difficult to grow. They're not like a gold crystal, hard, solid thing. Um, they are sort of floppy, uh, more like a gel almost. Uh, and some of these proteins are really difficult to crystallize. It can take weeks, months, even years in some cases to grow a crystal big enough to study. 
And that's a huge problem. We don't have months or years. Uh, we barely have weeks. So if you don't need to grow as big a crystal, well, then you can get, get, to, the, get to the synchrotron faster. And that's where MSS2 comes in. We can study much smaller crystals than you can anywhere else in the world by volume about 200 times smaller than anywhere else. And that's been a really important advantage uh, for this particular race that we're in right now. The ability for drug companies come to us very early in their process, very early in their synthesis, and still study something, get some answers to the questions they have. We can look at crystals as small as one micron. Again, that's about a hundredth of the width of a human hair. The other piece that we've been able to do, again, uh, other synchrotrons around the world are also at this, but is automating this process really well. And that allows you to get high throughput, move these samples through really quickly. Again, all part of the a race to discover new drugs. And I wanted to show you uh, that automation. And I've got a movie here. Let me just pause it for a second to tell you what's going on in this picture. So this is the screen that the experimenters would see if they were sitting at the beam line or even if they were sitting at their remote institution back home. The uh, bottom right-hand corner here is a picture of the robot. And what you're going to see, and I'll start the movie again, is that robot, uh, which is the green arm, taking a sample out of the dewar, where it's kept at liquid nitrogen temperatures, and mounting it into the, uh, into the beam line, ready to take data. The image directly above the robot, is, you'll see the arm coming in, bringing, that, uh, or bringing the sample in, rather, mounting it on what we call the goniometer, uh, and then cooling it down with a, a gaseous nitrogen jet. The X-ray beam comes in from the top of this figure, by the way. What is currently a black square will be an optical uh, microscope image of the sample in its little loop. You'll see that in a minute as it gets spun around into the beam. And the only other thing to point out to you all is the top picture, the sort of red with uh, the white dots. That's the image from the camera, and you'll see the diffraction pattern uh, when it gets to that point in a minute. So let me just back it up and start it. And so the first thing that happens is the robot picks the sample up and then puts it into the beam line. You see it coming in from the right there, uh, mounted there. The sample is on the end of that needle-like structure. Uh, and as you see now, the optical image has appeared. It'll start moving this uh, rod around, trying to center it in the beam. And so in a minute, the computer will be spinning this around, trying to find the center rotation. You see that happening now. Um, and I should uh, emphasize, this all completely without human intervention. This whole uh, movie, which will run about three minutes, I won't show you the whole thing. Again, no human intervention at any point in that. The computer is able to pick up the sample, mount it, align it, take the data, and move on to the next, uh, the next sample. So this is really, again, a highly automated process. What you're seeing it now, is, as I said, is it's spinning into the center rotation. The computer is trying to find uh, that center rotation and put the sample there where the beam hits. And now it's just going to do a quick scan of the beam across the loop here to try and find the sample. So now it's going to be looking at the diffraction pattern as it takes this data uh, and just see just a real quick survey to find out where the best parts of the crystal are. And it'll then go back and take the data there. So I'll just let it run through this quickly. And you'll see the first step in this. So it's found the sample, and you see now the, the green areas are the, where it's diffracting the best. Um, so it now knows uh, where it should concentrate on taking the data, and I'll just advance it. What's happening now is it's doing a bit more finer centering, and I don't need to um, spend time doing that. And then hopefully this will work. So I've just jumped ahead, and now the computer will start taking the data for real, and you'll see it uh, uh, slowly spinning the sample through the beam. And now if you look at the top uh, image, which is the red, uh, a screen, you should start seeing as the sample is rotated through, it meets these various diffraction conditions. And you see the pattern uh, appearing on the camera. And the computer now can collect that data and send it to the pipelines, which will analyze it and produce the protein uh, crystal structure. So again, a really highly automated, very optimized process, the result of, I don't know, 20 years of work around the world to get to a place like this. And again, we've really optimized it at NSLS2. So this is the machinery we brought to bear on COVID-19. And the first example I want to talk about is that uh, work of Dale Kreetler and company who used this, if you like, the intuition uh, approach, having a good guess based on work done on SARS-1 uh, about what molecules might work to inhibit the binding process. So this is working directly with that spike protein. Remember the red proteins on the uh, surface of the ball. The picture on the top left here is the uh, protein uh, crystals, these are tiny crystals, not the smallest we've ever studied, but fairly small. These are about 100 microns in length. Uh, and the crystal uh, was grown here at Brookhaven and studied at NSS2. 
And what this crystal is, is a crystal of the protein structure, at least a piece of the structure from the spike protein, together with this inhibiting uh, peptide that we hope will uh, prevent, prevent uh, the binding. And so that structure was solved. That's what you're seeing here is the uh, solved structure. The helixes uh, in this image are the spike proteins, or a piece of the spike protein, and the ball and stick models are the inhibitor molecule. And we can see that it's bound quite tightly in with those spikes. And so the hope is that this would then prevent uh, infection. And this uh, molecule and related molecules have been tested now in animal uh, models, this, in this case, ferrets. Ferrets were chosen because they have the same receptor proteins that humans do in their lungs. Uh, so they're a really good uh, test case for this uh, kind of thing. So what these researchers did was they took these molecules, um, and they took a, a group of ferrets, uh, half of whom got these molecules sprayed up into their noses each day, so just a nasal spray, and the other half were untreated. And then they looked at uh, cultures taken from their uh, lung cells over the course of a, of a week or so. And as you'll see, uh, the fluorescence, uh, the green fluorescence here is the result of infected cells. And you see that by the end of a week, all the ferrets that were untreated uh, had developed COVID-19. They'd become infected. And all those ferrets that were treated with a nasal spray were uninfected, were clean. So that's a really uh, exciting result, very promising. Uh, they've done the same experiments on human lung cells, not in humans yet, but at least on the cells, and shown that it's effective there too. So this is quite exciting. And the structure that we solved at NSS2 uh, is a uh, peptide related to these ones that binds even more strongly. So the message I want to give you here is this is promising research. It's very exciting, but still there's some way to go. Uh, these aren't yet available at CVS, uh, but one could hope. So that was one example showing uh, the approach where you've uh, taken some intuition uh, behind what you might uh, try. We've also been working on the computational side to predict uh, ahead of time using uh, sophisticated computational models. Uh, there are nine target proteins that the group have been looking at here, and I've listed the proteins uh, with you now. They developed the workflow that goes through the um, calculations with the uh, drugs to find out which ones bind, how strongly they bind, where they bind. Um, Again, that's a very big problem. They took a lot of effort to speed up those algorithms. They're now running at about 10 million combinations an hour that they're trying out. And something like 50 billion combinations have been tried to this point, with about 100 possible top hits that are worth looking at experimentally coming out of that search. So a small hit rate, but nonetheless significant. This is Shantanu Jha and Li Tan have been working on that here. This is work funded by NVBL. So of course, you can't just simply take the work of the computers and decide that's real life. You have to test it experimentally. So that, again, requires the protein uh, crystallography effort and to be able to synthesize these drugs bound with the proteins uh, and then crystallize them. So those work has also been going on in the collaboration between biology and light source 2 here. Experiments were carried out on tiny, tiny volumes of samples. So nanoliters of the sample uh, were needed for these experiments. And just to give you a sense of scale, that's about a millionth of a teaspoon of liquid, if you like. Um, that was able to be successfully uh, crystallized and uh, shown uh, the structure solved of this one protein called MPRO bound with one of these drugs. I'm showing you one example now. There's been others done. This is an exact example of a drug called Teleprevir, which has been approved already by the FDA for fighting hepatitis C. So this is a pre-approved drug. Um, the computer modeling, which is shown in yellow here. So the yellow is the drug, uh, the yellow and blue um, so see, stick model, if you like. And the computer predicted that we bound to this one particular pocket in MPRO. MPRO is the SARS protein, uh, which is uh, the blue and uh, cyan and red kind of ball uh, structure here. Uh, we were able to solve that structure uh, experimentally at NSS2, the Teleprevir bound with MPRO, and that's the pink uh, place, uh, pink uh, model you see here. So this is showing you that the computer model really got it very uh, close to reality, really very accurate. And that's really uh, encouraging because it tells you you can trust these computer models. So the running through these billions of combinations is a worthwhile exercise. The results it spits out are indeed promising and worth following up on. So this is a work that Kumran Desanyan, Babak Andy, and Yan uh, Karatuhik uh, were all involved in the biological side. And again, Shantanu Jha and others on the computational side. The other point I want to make here is that these workflows originally came from uh, workflows that were developed for fighting or develop, trying to discover cancer-fighting drugs. And they've been improved by factors of 100 or even 1,000 uh, times faster now as a result of the work that the, uh, the push for COVID that the, um, the folks have been involved in. And that implies that you could then perhaps take, once, 
once these have been optimized, take them back and apply these same kind of uh, approaches to other diseases like, like cancer. So this may have other beneficial effects as well as uh, the fight of, against COVID-19. Those approaches are all great if you can get a protein crystal. You can't always get a protein crystal. Uh, and then you have to look for other routes to find the structure of these proteins. And one of the other approaches that is really powerful is cryo-electron microscopy, electron microscopy um, which is a technique that we've also been developing here at Brookhaven. This was something that was underway uh, last year. Um, and then when COVID hit, we rushed to finish it. Uh, this pushed, even during MinSafe, we had to finish. This. So there was a brand new building built, a new microscope arrived and was commissioned all in record time. And this was again a great collaboration between uh, the scientists, between the uh, uh, MPO office here, FNO, who were able to work through MinSafe to get this commissioned uh, ahead of what was otherwise our schedule. And the reason they rushed that is because it was able to be brought to bear against COVID-19. Um, and we knew that was, the, uh, that was an important thing to be able to do. One of the LDRDs I mentioned at the start uh, is active here. This is uh, Chun Lu, Chin Shai, and Li Guo Wang, all interested in looking at these membrane proteins that I mentioned, the proteins that sit on the ball of the virus. Um, and they've been uh, solving the structure of one of those particular proteins, the E protein, uh, bound with one of the human uh, proteins called PALS1. And this is important in patients who have very strong reactions to COVID-19. This seems to be something that's playing a role. So this is a very important protein to understand and try and uh, block its function, the E protein binding. Um, the other reason this is important is that the membrane proteins tend to mutate less quickly than the spike proteins. So if you develop a drug against one of these proteins, it could have a longer, uh, longer lifetime in terms of being effective. So this work is still early, it's still um, uh, being moved along, but this is, this is also a very promising area of research that Brookhaven uh, is perhaps leading the world in. It's important to uh, let you all know that the work we're doing here is safe. Uh, we are not looking at live virus as here at Brookhaven. There is no chance of anyone getting infected uh, because of the work they're doing here. Uh, and the reason for that is we're not looking at the virus itself. We're looking at pieces of the proteins that make up the virus. And as I explained at the start, unless you have that whole structure, the ball, the spikes, and all its internal contents, it's, it's a machine that doesn't work. It's like having a steering wheel of a car, but not the whole car. You can't drive off in a steering wheel. And it, just the same way, these pieces of proteins can't infect you with uh, COVID-19. And these pieces of protein are synthesized artificially in a lab because we know the gene sequence for these proteins. So we can't even accidentally bring a virus particle in with these little pieces of uh, protein. So it's really very safe. So that was the, the drug discovery portion of the talk. I'm gonna talk a bit about the modeling that's been going on. And the first example I want to show you here is work that Laura Fierce and company have been doing modeling the uh, aerosol uh, flow. Uh, and in this particular case, I'm gonna show you someone who's speaking and how they exhale uh, viron particles, particles of um, water uh, and aerosol viron particles, particles that contain the virus. And you can see here, this is a, a sort of intensity map, if you like, of how far the virus particles uh, spread as well as someone just, just speaking at a normal, normal volume. And two meters here is the six feet distance we kind of keep in mind for socially distancing being bigger than. By the way, this is a log scale, so there's about a factor of 100 uh, range in density uh, on this plot. So what Laura's able to do is then model the effect of um, uh, how much another person will be able, would, would absorb of these, of these virus particles, depending on how far away they are from the first person. And that's this solid line shown on the plot here, and you see it drops off sort of exponentially, so the further away you are, the safer you are. And then what's the effect of putting a mask on that one person, on the affected person? And this is a, a non-medical surgical mask uh, that she's modeling here. Uh, and you see it really dramatically reduces how many virus uh, particles are, uh, are spread um, and really protects um, that second individual. And this is a drop of, of a really significant drop in terms of the density. And if that second individual also wears a mask, then you see this dotted line now, it drops yet further. So again, the mask protects you and it protects the other person. So this is really kind of very graphically illustrating the importance of wearing a mask uh, at all times. The other modeling that's been going on at the lab is to try and model the spread, the spread of infections in sort of communities from person to person. How, what, does, what, uh, what policies could you put in place to split, slow the spread of that infection? This is a work done by Alexei Chichenko and company um, uh, from the CFN. And they modeled, uh, the, uh, they developed a model, computational model for the spread of the, of the virus uh, based on 
modeling early data at the start of the pandemic. And the plot here on the top left is showing you uh, uh, that model. Um, what was special about their model was they're able to use multiple different inputs in the model. So not just modeling the number of new cases, but also the, um, the number of hospitalizations, the number of ICU beds uh, in use, and even the number of uh, deaths. And by combining those data sets together, they got a very accurate model. And what they found, not surprisingly, was the longer they let that model run, the more data it got trained on, if you like, the more accurate it became. So that if you allowed it to collect data up to, let's say, May 1st, um, then you saw this very narrow spread in uncertainty. It was really a very accurate model. So they were, their collaborators there were from Illinois, and the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign got interested in using this model to help inform its own policies for when the students came back to school at the end of the summer. That caused widespread uh, publicity and some, uh, some mirth because um, this model underestimated the students' uh, desire to party. And much was fun was made of the fact that physicists came up with this model, and perhaps physicists don't really know anything about parties, so why would they get that right? So that was all sort of uh, very fun. But in fact, uh, the model did really well. And working with the policymakers at UIUC, they were able to do a very good job of controlling the spread of COVID at the university. And to illustrate that, I'm showing you here the uh, infection rate of the state of Illinois, uh, which is in some sense the community this university is embedded in, of course. Uh, and then below that on the same time scale is the infection rate at UIUC. And you see while there was a spike uh, right at the start of term, after that, they managed to keep the number of case, cases fairly low compared to the big spike uh, seen in the state. So I think uh, one could declare that success for the uh, university administrators. The last example I wanted to talk about was some work uh, trying to develop new tests. And the point here is that while we have tests for COVID-19, and the most common one is the PCR test, or the most accurate one is the PCR test, which is the nasal swabs where they um, collect the collect samples from the back of your, uh, from your nose. That's a very accurate test, but it's time consuming to take that. It's uh, not necessarily the most comfortable process. And uh, it takes a long time to process the data and get the answers back. There are tests of antibodies in humans, but that's in some sense too late. Uh, if you've already developed the antibodies, uh, you're probably past the infectious stage. And you wanna try and catch this earlier. So the work at the CFN is looking at ways to develop um, specialized nanostructures that could detect the presence of a virus particle much sooner, much more sensitively than the current tests. And the goal here is to be able to detect even the presence of one single virus particle and do so in a quantitative way so you know exactly how many are around in a simple, inexpensive test that one could imagine using at home. And the dream here would be something you could do at home perhaps before you set out for work each day, know that you're not infected and then are not infectious and then, um, then be able to go about your daily lives. So something like this would really transform how we live our lives. And that's uh, Ola Gang leading that, again, in collaboration with biology department, instrumentation department, and their external collaborators. So that's about my time up now. Um, thank you for your attention. I wanted to summarize by saying a few words uh, about this uh, process. This has been obviously a really intense time. It's been a very collaborative time, both within the folks at Brookhaven, but also across the DOE complex. We're all working together to fight this challenge uh, that we face. Much of the capabilities that we have here at Brookhaven and the expertise we have here at Brookhaven has been really uh, well suited to this challenge, has been brought to bear very quickly. Brookhaven is a big part of this fight. I talked about drug discovery, I've talked about the computer modeling, modeling the virus transport, and I didn't really get a chance to talk about it, but we're also working on materials uh, manufacturing issues in terms of PPE. I think it's fair to say that COVID-19 will be beaten, uh, science will beat it, and Brookhaven will be part of that uh, victory. And Speaking personally now, uh, that makes me feel very proud to be part of Brookhaven and part of this effort. We have come together at this time of crisis and we've stood up and we're fighting it. And it's been a very intense, stressful time uh, for us all, but I do take some comfort in that, that we are part of the fight. And um, like I said, really proud of what we're doing here and um, proud to be part of it myself. Hello everyone and welcome back to the live Q&A session. I hope you enjoyed that presentation. Um, we are back with our panelists to answer all your questions that you submitted during the talk in the live chat. And to start off, um, I want to start off with a very simple question. John, you've talked a lot about what happened at the lab in research terms, but are we still working, fighting COVID-19 right now at the lab? And 
How is that looking right now? Uh, yes, thanks, Cara. It's still very active. Uh, a lot of things that I was talking about in that talk are still underway, looking for new drug molecules, um, working for the sensors, that activity is still going on. The work on cryo-EM is still happening. In fact, they had a very successful recent result where they uh, solved the structure of one of the membrane proteins. So yeah, it's still a very active topic of research. Kirsten's group, as um, she can also talk about, still still going on. So absolutely, still still a big big area for us. And um, yeah, no, that that sounds awesome. So that that brings us directly to Kirsten. Kirsten, um, your group did help fight COVID nineteen in different ways. Um, would you like to explain how this works a little bit more precise or similar, a mixture of both? if that has been done for different pandemics before? So, so we as, as National Lab have not worked on pandemics before, but we have worked on drug discovery for, for cancer, um, again, with a, with a much, much smaller team. So um, for, for COVID, we really had to put out, pull out all the stops. Uh, we brought 140 scientists together from nine different labs uh, to work together on a very short time frame and um, while we had uh, computational pipelines that did drug discovery, we did this in comparison at a, at a pedestrian uh, pace. And uh, for, for COVID, we really put this into a sports car. So we did billions of, of calculations. And um, it has improved our abilities to, to look at other and fight other diseases, look for drugs that could fight other diseases uh, in the future much more efficiently than we could before this started. So it's, uh, it's to some extent similar, but, but much more advanced than when we started and, and uh, great progress for, for science and, and opens up lots of opportunities for the future. Wow, that sounds really interesting. Um, Sean, you have built a facility while COVID was underway. Um, we at Brookhaven Lab have built and operated facilities for a while. How was that? How was making the cryo-EM happen um, in the process? Unusual, I would have said. <laughs> we had to do quite a lot of work with both the lab and with our people to make sure that work could be safe. Our vendor worked very closely with us to make sure that they could accelerate the part of this because not only did we have to get the space ready, the company had to build the electron microscope in this space and do that under both high stress, both in terms of the work environment because of COVID and also the time we wanted to do this in. We pulled the build time forward by several months, accelerated the acceptance of it, required everybody to work together very closely and to communicate well which we did. And then we were able to bring the microscope up and working in July, which was many months ahead of our original schedule. And as soon as we accepted it, we opened up access to it for COVID-19 research. And it ran through until the end of December in that mode. And then in January, we opened it up to the world. And I'm pleased to say it's got scientists using the instrument every week and it's proven a, a, a big success. But it was, it was difficult and required quite a lot of communication that would have gone more slowly in the past. All right, wow, that is a lot. How many researchers have now used uh, the cryo since you opened up for, for COVID uh, research? Do you know that? Um, how many groups have been through mm -hmm. we've had at least um one group per week so where are we We're about 10 weeks in so i would say 10 different research teams have been going through however how many samples that is how many scientists that is i couldn't tell you off the top of my head it's probably about 20 to 30 different research projects that have been held in abeyance waiting for access to these instruments because it's, you know, time on these instruments is at a premium and it's difficult to get. So I think we're making a contribution there. And um, as John alluded to, some of the work we did through COVID-19 has been brought to a successful conclusion thanks to access to this instrument. And so that's 
going to be published soon and we think it will have a, a big impact on um, the research that um, and the expectations of what we can do here. All right. Um, we have another question from uh, Facebook. Um, are we also working on new strains? So are those considered in the research that we're currently doing either at the synchrotron cryo-EM or even in the computing facilities? Uh, maybe we start with John. I was going to bounce that straight to Sean because he and I have been having some conversations recently about looking exactly at the, str the strains tend to be different versions of the spike protein, these red proteins here. And so that's something we are looking at. Sean, you'll know the latest on that. So I guess there are two aspects. One is the, the computational side, which I'll leave to Kirsten. In terms of the structural work and understanding the specifics of how the biology is altered by these mutations, the answer is yes, we're working on this both from our own research and from the research we help other scientists um, undertake. And we're hoping to be able to continue helping them for as long as it takes. Kirsten should answer for the computing though. Yeah, we're, we're looking at that as well. We're waiting for, for our experimental collaborators like Sean to come up with the structures for the, for the new uh, variants so that we can feed them into our computational models and then we'll run them through and see how uh, differently they may react to different compounds. All right, um, maybe just for, for the viewers, could you explain again how you work with the experimentalists for the computing part, just roughly how that collaboration works oh, out? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So um, to, to do the, what, what you do is computational screening. And so we have a model of the, a computational model of the virus, uh, usually of the spike protein. And uh, we, we then look um, on the spike proteins, there are pockets um, that could be possible points of attack to this, uh, for, from the immune system or from, from a drug uh, onto the virus. And so we're looking at those pockets and look at, see, see it like a puzzle. We're trying to see which um, compounds, which drugs could fit into, into those pockets. And uh, there are about, um, th th there are billions of, of possible uh, puzzle pieces out there. And so we, we are trying to see which ones are fitting and uh, running through all of them, basically. But what we need as a starting point is, is really this model uh, this first piece uh, of the puzzle, which is what the, the protein, what, what the virus looks like and where those pockets are. And so we would look, for example, with the var variants, how those might have changed and therefore how um, they might react differently to, to the different drugs that are out there. Great. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. Um, <clears throat> you all said that we started COVID research basically when COVID came along. So the question from one of our viewers on YouTube is to all of you, um, what surprised you most since you started COVID research? Maybe I'll start with Sean, because he just made it. Gosh, that's a, that's a good question and um, a tough question, which I could answer in a, a number of different ways. One thing that surprised me was the degree and the speed with which the international community got together to work on it, to a common goal and the openness with which we were sharing information. That was really heartening to see and very helpful for us in getting started. In, in terms of scientifically, what has surprised me is how sophisticated something as simple as a virus is, how this particular ver version with the subtle changes compared to other versions of the virus, how effective it is in infecting us and evading our immune system, and then how quickly we've been able to find responses. So those are three surprises and, and three things I think are very heartening for the future. Kirsten? 
Yeah, I think uh, Sean took most of the good ones, <laughs> but but I think yeah. what what I uh, I like really liked. Um, I don't think I was completely surprised by it, but it was still really wonderful to see. When we started out, we actually didn't have any funding or time to to do this, so we did. We started with the research in our spare time, and we asked people, uh, scientific colleagues, to donate time, basically their spare time, to help. And, and we had an absolutely wonderful and tremendous response to that. People said, yeah, absolutely, I'll do this. What, whatever, I have a computer at home, I'll, I'll do what you, what you need to do. And that was, that was really great to see. And, and it's, it, it made a huge difference to, to get started right away and be able to do that. John? Um, so similar to Sean, I think what surprises me and pleases me most is the speed with which the scientific community engaged on this and and essentially solved the problem. When it first came along, you know, the virus structure was solved within a month or something. Um, and I remember right at the start of the pandemic, people saying, well, you know, the, the way out of this is going to be a good vaccine. And best case, that's a year and a half away. And, you know, we, the scientific community solved the problem in nine months. And, you know, there was vaccines out there that have been shown to be very, very effective. 95% is a phenomenal number for a vaccine. And that came about because of work, uh, you know, like, like the work we were doing at the lab where the structure was understood quickly and then responses were developed. Um, so that's been, uh, that's been a, a, a really positive story, I think, for the scientific community. And then again, like uh, both Sean and Kirsten said, the way the community came together and worked together, I see that close uh, with the national labs. Traditionally, the national labs sort of work together, but we compete as well. We compete for funding, we compete for science results. All that went away when the COVID pandemic hit and we get together in a round table you know, once a week and we share anything that it would take to get it onto the next step. And that spirit of cooperation was really, um, really uh, motivating and inspiring to be part of and uh, something to be proud of, I think, for the National Labs to be tackling it this way. Is that part, was that part of the National Virtual Biology Laboratory, the NVBL that you're exactly. heading that, that, that didn't exist this time last year. That was created uh, in largely in response to the COVID pandemic. I think it will survive and continue and has you know, proven to be a really effective way to working together. But yeah, that started with a bunch of us meeting, you know, once a week. Um, and just it grew from there with strong support from the DOE who saw it early as being needed. All right. Um, we're going to take a different direction a little bit now. Chris, we got a question from Chris from YouTube. Aside from global, global context surrounding the research, how has the drug discovery process differed between cancer and this virus? Were there any unexpected challenges that had to be addressed? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, what, one thing was, of course, the time constraint that we had. It's also, the other thing is for, for cancer, we had uh, initial ideas of what drugs might might be helpful. And so we had a much smaller number to, to screen, whereas here we basically said, okay, we don't know what's gonna work because no one has ever developed anything. And so we have to look at everything that's out there, drugs that are already in use for other purposes, um, compounds that have never been that that have been used in drugs but could be combined in a different way so it's a much bigger bigger space um, that that we had to look through and thinking about how to do that and do this in a timely fashion so that we could get faster um, that that was really um, a, a huge uh, challenge for us and so making making it fast um, we've improved the speed by thousands of times to to get to the rates that we needed to to crank to to really check through all the all the different options and and that uh, was was a big challenge for us um otherwise i think we we haven't had challenges if anything we had pleasant surprises um our uh, cancer work was much more uh, computational and less integrated with the experimental work and so being able to work directly with our experimental colleagues and getting the structures, uh, we are coming up with possible leads. Uh, 
compounds that could or drugs that could work well and then being able to pass this on to our experimental colleagues and say can you test this out and then getting feedback and say yes this worked or no this didn't work which meant we had to maybe adjust something in our our screening process to be more specific and more accurate in what we were predicting mm -hmm. and i thought that that was fantastic and conversely for us the virus presented a, a smaller number of proteins for us to work in than the gigantic field of cancer research. And so we knew very early which were the targets we should try to find supporting evidence to help with the computational work, areas which would show promise for antiviral development and the structures which would be important for the development of the vaccine. And so for us, the work became focused down onto a smaller number of protein elements, which we could look in at extremely fine detail, but also have this rapid turnaround in terms of the interaction with Kirsten and, and the computational folks as well. So in that respect, it was different too. John, would you like to add anything to that? Or shall we go to the next question? Uh, I was just wondering if Sean wanted to comment on the size of the crystals that he was looking at uh, now compared to um, you know, other drug discovery pathways. And, and that's, a, that's a very good point because, because we started a lot of this work a year ago, give or take, the projects weren't so mature. And what typically happens in a drug discovery process is that one refines and refines and refines the the crystallization protocol so the crystals are somewhat larger and by large i mean 50 to 100 microns so the width of a hair if i had her you would notice but in in terms of these projects we were having to work with much smaller crystals a, a tenth or a hundredth of those sizes which means you need very intense x-ray beams and that's what nsls2 was built to deliver extremely intense small beams. So we were able to start work on projects much earlier in the no than in the normal development cycle, which was helpful, I think. That coupled with the automation we have in place, even with these small crystals and small beams, meant that we could go through hundreds of samples in a day, test a large fraction of the um, hypotheses for binders that Ed Kirsten was coming up with and be able to deliver that information back quickly. And so we were probably compared to many projects much earlier in the, the process than we would have normally seen a, a drug um, discovery um, project come to us. All right, yeah, no, that is really, really good. Um, we have another question from YouTube, mostly directed at Sean and John. Uh, Rajat is asking, um, so he says hi, and he has attended Summer Sunday last year and heard you both talk about the contribution of NSLS2 towards the fight against COVID-19. But his question is, has Brookhaven directly made contributions to Operation Warp Speed? So maybe I'll, I'll take that first. That, uh, so Operation Walk Speed, for those of you who don't know, was the US government's uh, funding effort to produce the vaccine very quickly. So they funded a number of companies to, uh, they told, told a number of companies up front that they would buy the vaccine from them if they were able to develop it. Um, so we have worked with a number of companies. Uh, I think there were order nine companies came through NSS2 to carry out research in this last, uh, last year. Um, and some of those included people working on the vaccine. So. In that sense, yes, we weren't funded by the government to work on our Operation Vaccine, but the companies who were did come through Brookhaven and came through NSS2. There you go. All right. Um, we're reaching our time limit, so we're doing one more question. And we're leaving the world of crystallography, and we're going over to the airflow modeling that you spoke about in your presentation, John. Um, how does that modeling and the manufacturing uh, material research from, from N95 mask impact? What kind of outcome came out of that? Okay, so I, a couple of outcomes came out of that kind of modeling. One was to understand the role the masks can play in slowing the transmission of the virus particles and slowing, slowing people getting infected. So people were doing using those kind of models to model, for example, airflow in a school bus and 
which windows should you open to, to minimize the chance of getting infection uh, while kids were on the way to school. So that's one aspect of that modeling that was very useful. And that's been rolled out in a number of different places. The other aspect was to try and understand um, the manufacturing process behind those masks itself. How do you make the N95 masks and other ways to make them better and uh, faster and cheaper. And that also, so Brookhaven wasn't directly involved in this, but the NVBL effort that I mentioned earlier was. Uh, and so this is a group uh, led by out of Oak Ridge National Lab. They worked uh, with a company called Dermatech to, to improve their manufacturing processes. Dermatech, uh, as a result, tripled in size. They're now manufacturing one and a half million masks a day and 95 masks a day in the US um, for the US market. And I, as the, I understand the tax revenue generated by that pays for all the other research. From that aspect alone, pays for all the other research we've already been talking about. So there's a direct benefit there to the US economy and, and to the public in having these masks available. Yeah, that is very impressive. So since we're already at the end, I would like to thank all our speakers and panelists again for answering all the questions. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I hope you enjoyed being here. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, it's been great. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for all your questions that came through. All right, and thank you to all of you who've watched us and hopefully now learned a little bit more about the research that is going on at Brookhaven Lab to fight COVID-19. Thank you all so much for being here.